Okay, hi everyone. Just wanting to let you know that we're gonna start Myths in Our Stars in about six minutes, right at one o'clock. And just hold on while we let people in and handle the tech stuff. <clears throat> Hello, can we hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Hello. Do they need to be muted, unmuted? Um, we're going to have them muted for most of the time. And then um, this is going to be recorded and shared on social media. So if you guys don't feel comfortable being seen, we can, uh, you can also stop your video or um, whatnot. But just so you guys have the information. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Here we go. Oh wow, everybody's muted. Here. Carla, is there anything that, um, anything else that you need to clarify or questions or anything? Oh, sorry, I muted you. Unmute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No, okay. I, I'm okay. I'm pretty comfortable. Okay. Dealing, or, you know, interacting with the Zoom world now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I do have that pretty introductory slide that we can put up at whatever point that you want to do. Oh, that. sure. You know what? Um, let's, you can go, at, oh, here we go. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. Um, <laughs> you can, um, I think you can put it up. Let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> Hi, Sloan and Tegan. <laughs> and Olivia and is it Alia? Yeah. Aaliyah. 
Good to see you guys. I am unmuted, correct, Haley? So Haley, when I have the presentation up, I can't see Zoom. So if you need anything, if you could just let me know verbally. I can definitely do that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like um, we just have, uh, looks like one person joining us more. And if there's anybody who comes in um, soon, I'll let them in too. <laughs> but we'll go ahead and get started. So hi, everybody. Um, this is Miss Haley at Loveland Library. And I'm glad to see some of your faces. And um, I'm really excited about today's program. It's called Myths in Our Stars. And uh, Carla, who is a NASA ambassador, is here with us today. She is going to be presenting about mythology and constellations and a whole bunch of cool spacey stuff and I'm um, very excited to have her. A um, couple things just to remind you, please try and keep yourself on mute as much as possible um, unless we call on you just so that we can keep the sound quality, um, uh, have good sound quality. And then the other thing <clears throat> I wanted to mention is that this uh, session is being recorded and we are going to share it on social media. So if you don't feel comfortable, um, you know, being on social media, please go ahead and turn off your video. Um, and, or you can watch the video later. Um, if that is more comfortable for you guys. So just want to let you guys know, and then I'm just going to hand it over to Carla. Great. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And a big thank you to Haley for putting this all together so we could spend the afternoon. Um, with each other. And I wanted to also thank the Loveland Public Library for inviting me back. I've done several presentations at Loveland, so some of you might recognize me, so it's wonderful to see you again. So as Haley said, hi, I'm Carla. I'm a NASA Solar System Ambassador. I actually used to work for NASA. I worked at NASA JPL. I worked at the place that builds the rovers, if you're familiar with the rovers that go to Mars. And they also built a Voyager spacecraft and a whole bunch of other things. So I used to work there. And if you've seen the movie Transformers or maybe some other movies about Griffith Observatory, I used to work at Griffith. And I also used to work at Mount Wilson Observatory. And I used to be a telescope operator. So if you've heard of the Hubble telescope, that's the one that's up in orbit. But the man, Edwin Hubble, actually used to work a long time ago at the observatory where I was a telescope operator. So now I work at Fisk Planetarium in Summers and Bosch Observatory at the CU Boulder campus. And, um, but I do a lot of volunteer work. So it's wonderful to be with you today and talk about myths in the stars. Um, we are going to have an activity at the end, which we'll all be able to chat and engage and participate in. But if you come up with any questions, if you could just write them down and hold them to the end, that would be great. However, Haley is going to be checking the chat and we'll check in with her occasionally to see if anybody has a burning question that just can't wait. So without further ado, let's get started. So this is one of my favorite pictures and I have this up on my wall. This is a beautiful little picture of animals looking at the stars from Boulder. Hey, Carla, artist sorry to interrupt. Boulder. I can't, I can't see what you're talking about. Oh, it's not coming up? No. Is, do other people see it? Maybe. The slideshow? Okay. No. I don't know why that would be weird. It was working earlier. <laughs> Let's try again. There we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. I wonder why that happened. 
There, do you see it now? Yes, perfect, okay. thank you. Yeah, so as I was saying, this is one of my favorite little pictures from an artist in Boulder, and her name's Harriet, and she drew this lovely painting of little animals looking up in the sky and deciding what constellations they see, and you can see the beautiful mountains there in Boulder. So when we look up in the sky, we see stars and planets and the moon and occasionally a comet like Comet Neowise, which has been in our skies last week and this week. Um, and different people in different cultures all over the world for thousands of years have looked up in the sky and created myths to describe what they saw. And they created stories because when we create stories, it helps us remember you know, what we're seeing. And so humans like stories. I know I like stories. So we've only had telescopes for about 400 years. And before that, when we looked up in the sky, we thought that the stars were like our sun, but we weren't 100% sure. But I just love this little picture because it shows little animals looking up in the sky. For some reason, Haley, it's not letting me advance. That's exciting. I'm not sure why that would be. Let me try. And it's completely. Try it now. No? No. Hmm. I don't know how to fix that. That's super weird. Um, maybe I'm going to request control and adjust it. <laughs> maybe uh, see if I can do that. Sorry guys, hang on one second. Just focus on the little critters looking up. There we go. Okay. Do you wanna just advance for me? I don't know if I can. I'm, I've never done that part before, so. Oh yeah, it asked, for your, it asked me to give you approval to advance. Okay. Sorry guys. <laughs> Is it, I don't. I don't see it. I don't think I can do it. Okay, oh. let me see if I can yeah. take control again. Yeah, sorry about that. I thought that would maybe help. It's like my computer. I can't even stop sharing. There we go. So weird. Oh, I go. see things changing. Okay. <laughs> not sure. I'm not sure either. This is okay. all good. Then. Okay. <laughs> so. When we look up in the sky, you know, the skies and stars are a calendar, there are clock, and there are compass. So we can use the sky as to, as for a calendar to let us know kind of what season we're in. So in summertime, we have almost 15 hours of daylight. That's a lot of light. So that helps us know that it's summertime. In the winter, we only have about nine hours of daylight. I'm so sorry. I am not seeing the present presentation anymore. Goodness sakes, I'm not sure what's going on. If, I don't know if it would be helpful, but, um, oh, now I can see it. Maybe it's the presentation mode. Can you just click through it without, I know that it, uh, I don't know. Yeah, there you go. Is that Let's possible? That. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Let me get rid of this stuff over here because we don't need this. No, it's not gonna let me do that either. Okay, we'll just go with this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. Um, so yeah, so we can use the sky as our calendar by just knowing how much daylight we're experiencing. It kind of helps us know whether it's winter or whether it's summer. So this, oh gosh, none of the animations are gonna work. Do you, yeah, what about that? <laughs> Does that work? Uh, try and click through and see. Yeah, things just happened. Animation happened. Okay. Okay, it likes that one, okay. <laughs> 
So we can also use the sky as a calendar. When we look up and we see the stars, we can try and figure out what constellations we're seeing. And certain constellations are only visible at certain times during the year. So in the winter time, we see Orion. In the springtime, we see Leo the lion. So that's another indicator about what we're seeing in the sky and what season it is. So we can use the stars as our calendar. Now we can also use them as our clock. So I go up to Rocky Mountain National Park a lot and I take a lot of pictures of Long's Peak. So when you look at this picture, you know, it kind of looks like it might be mid morning. So that's how you can use the sky as a clock just by seeing how much light is out. What about this picture? This looks like it's getting pretty close to sunset. And this picture is nighttime. So that's another way that we can use the sky as a clock. Now they can also be used as our compass. So you can see some kids here looking at their shadow and putting down rocks on the lawn, trying to see how long their shadow is. So where we live here in Colorado, um, during the summertime, your shadow, if you go outside at noon, the sun will always be to your south and your shadow will go to the north. Now, if you lived in Alaska, the same thing would be the case, only your shadow would be really, really short because the sun would be high in the sky. Now, if you live in South America, sometimes you don't even have a shadow at all if you're on the equator because the sun is directly overhead. So your, the length of your shadow helps you kind of know where you are on our world. So how do we define nighttime? How do stars rise? So you can see this image here, this GIF image of our Earth spinning. Now the Earth is tilted a long, long, long time ago, probably four billion years ago, the Earth got smacked with something and that tilted us over. So we kind of are tilted like this. That's how we go around. And every time we go around the Earth spins, that's a day. And then we go around the sun once every year, about 365 days. But going around the sun like that, every day we move a little bit in our orbit and that makes it look like the stars are rising about four minutes every day, four minutes early every day. So if you take four minutes times 30 days in a month approximately, that's 120 minutes. So 120, there are 60 minutes in an hour. So if I divide 120 by 60, I get two hours. So every month, the stars are rising two hours earlier. So that's why you see different stars in the sky. And you can still see nighttime. There just went nighttime on North America. There it went on Australia, Africa. So that's what our world looks like way out in space. We're a beautiful blue marble just spinning and the sunlight is falling on us. So what is a constellation? When we look up in the sky, we see stars, right? We see lots of stars. Those are suns. Now, some of these stars are big and some are little. And our sun is just average. It's just very, very normal and average, but average is good. So we have a very calm sun. So it doesn't create a lot of problems. And that's why we're able to live here on earth. Now, these big stars, sometimes are really far away, so they look tiny. And these little stars sometimes are really close, so they look big. So when you look up at the sky, when you're looking at constellations, you're just seeing different stars at different distances. And like we talked about earlier, humans like to create stories. So we basically create stories out of these patterns that we see in the sky. Now I wanted to show you this video of us flying around the Big Dipper, but I'm a little unsure if it's gonna work. So we won't do the video, but I have the resource at the end of the presentation that you can click and you can go to YouTube and find it for yourself. Now what this video shows is it shows us flying out really far 
and going around these stars and looking and seeing how they move. And if you get far enough out, the Big Dipper doesn't look like a Big Dipper anymore. It kind of like starts to distort. But I just wanted to show you that all stars are different distances and different patterns. But the only reason why we create constellations is because we live here on Earth and we see the same sky. But if we had a big spaceship and we could fly really far out, all of the stars and constellations would change. So I really encourage you to go watch this video later. It's super cool. So there are 88 official constellations this was decided by a team of astronomers from all over the world um, and they belong to a group called the International Astronomical Union and in 1930 everybody had a big meeting and they sat together and they said okay let's figure out what constellations we're going to agree upon across the world and so they agreed on 88 constellations and that's been the same for 90 years. Because you know, different people around the world had different ideas about what constellation was this and what was that, but everyone came together and they were kind to each other and they met and they made an agreement. So we have 88 official constellations. Now, there are all kinds of things in the sky. There's a river, there's a queen, there's a king, there's a doctor. Actually, he's more of a pharmacist, but he's a doctor. There's a herder and a hiker. There's microscopes. There's ships. There's compasses and sec tents. There's shields. There's dogs. There's big dogs. There's little dogs. There's lions and horses and bunnies and goats and giraffes, and camels, and dolphins, and all kinds of stuff in the sky. There's snakes, there's flies, there's unicorns, if you can believe it, peacocks, who doesn't love a peacock? Eagles, bears, and even dragons in the sky. So out of the 88 constellations to prepare for this presentation, I went through and I charted every single one of them. And I figured out that there are 44 constellations that are animals. And then there are a bunch of constellations that are people and there are a bunch of constellations that are objects. I personally love the animals the best. So what, have you heard of our Milky Way? Haley, should we do a check-in? Is anybody live chatting? Does anybody have thoughts about what we've gone over or ideas about what the Milky Way is? I haven't seen anything yet, but I wonder if people might type in now that you brought it up. Yeah. Well, Haley, what do you think the Milky Way is? Have you thought about that? I, all I know is that it's a bunch of stars and we're in it. And then it's also a candy bar. That's all I've got. <laughs> that correct on all accounts. So Galileo 400 years ago, or exactly 411 years ago now in 1609, he was the first person um, that we think used a telescope to look up at the sky. And he looked at the Milky Way and just like Haley said, he saw stars and stars and more stars and more stars and more stars. And he was just completely dumbfounded because he didn't know that the Milky Way was stars. So for the longest time, everybody thought it was a river. We thought it was a big river in the sky and kind of a dividing line in the sky. But now we know it's stars. And like Haley said, we are in it. We are in this galaxy of stars. This is what the night sky looks like from a really dark location like up at Rocky Mountain National Park. Now this is what the Milky Way looks like edge on. So if you can imagine, did your mom or dad ever make you over easy eggs? I don't know about you, but I do not like over easy eggs. They are gross, but let's use it as kind of an analogy. Analogy is, to help, is like a word to help us understand what something else is like. So if you picture an over easy egg, 
you've got the yellow goopy stuff, right? That's the yolk. That is the center of our galaxy. It's the yolk. And then the white goopy stuff, it's all goopy, right? The white goopy stuff are the arms that come out from our Milky Way galaxy. So you can always think of our galaxy like an over easy egg. So the center is thick, yellow goopy, that's the core of our galaxy. And the white stuff on the edges, that's kind of the arms of our galaxy. This is what the galaxy looks like from the top down. Now, granted, we don't, this is an artist drawing and a picture of what our galaxy looks like because we can't get far enough away to actually see it. So if you think about, think about being an ant, think about being a tiny little ant living on a tree in a forest. Now that ant knows he's on a tree and he knows he's in a forest, but he doesn't know how big the forest is. He doesn't know how far it stretches in this direction or this direction. So it's even if he crawls to the very top of the tree, he's kind of looking around and still trying to figure out exactly what it looks like. So based on our research and based on all the telescope observations we've done, we think this is what our Milky Way looks like. So it's a spiral bar galaxy. You can see that bar in the center, and then you can see the spiral arms that come out. Now we on Earth, we live in the white gooky stuff and we're out here. So there is a big black hole in the center of the yellow gooky stuff, but it's really far away and it doesn't cause us any problems. And even if somebody pulled the sun out and plopped in a black hole, we'd be fine because it's just mass. So, and we orbit the sun because the sun is so massive. So if you just pulled out the sun and put in a Milky Way, we would still orbit and we would just be fine. Now, granted, it would be really cold, so that wouldn't be good, but otherwise, don't let black holes scare you. They're very cool. So myths, let's talk about myths. What are some myths of the Milky Way? So for thousands of years, different cultures had different ideas about what they saw in the sky. And the Milky Way being a large collection of stars had a lot of myths associated with it. So the Greek myths can be really, really scary and they're mostly focused on people. And like I said, I really like animals. So I tend to like the myths, you know, dealing with animals. But other cultures also were like me and they kind of like wrote about a lot of the stuff that they saw in the sky as nature and animals and things that they were familiar with. But the Greeks nonetheless thought that the Milky Way was milk. They thought that it was milk from Hera and Hera was a, a goddess and she had stolen somebody's baby which is just sounds awful, but she had stolen somebody's baby and the Greeks thought that this was the milk coming from her to feed her stolen baby. That sounds too scary to me. Other cultures thought it was a bridge and it was a bridge to heaven or to the afterlife. In the Mayan culture, they thought the Milky Way was the giant tree in the sky, the tree of life that rose from the horizon and went all the way to the top. The Pawnee people from here in North America thought it was buffalo dust from them running and they thought that the dust kicked up and went in the sky. The Apache and Sioux cultures thought that the Milky Way was from their ancestors, that it was departing spirits going up into the sky and the uh, Sioux called it the, the spirit road. So those are all different myths about the Milky Way. <gasps> Did you know that there are bears in the sky? There are. There's a big bear and there's a little bear. And when we look up in the sky, the bears formally, their official name, like say, let's say your name is William but everybody calls you Billy. So this is kind of the same thing as for constellations. 
William is the official name and Billy is kind of the informal name. So when we talk about Ursa Major, that's the formal name. When we talk about the Big Bear uh, or the Big Dipper, that's kind of more the informal name. So the Big Dipper is just part of Ursa Major. You can see the Big Bear drawn there on the sky. So the Big Dipper is technically what we call an asterism, which is just a different collection of stars. It's like a constellation, but not like really official. And then the little bear is just showing the little dipper there. And once again, that's kind of the unofficial name. So these stars are also circumpolar. So have you ever heard of the North Star? Yeah, the North Star is called Polaris. And if you can picture, so why do we have a North Star? I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna be really funny, but I'm gonna try and show you why we have a North Star. So let me move my chair. So if you pretend that I'm the Earth, this is my North Pole, this is my South Pole, and this is my Equator. So if I'm the Earth, I spend once a day like this. but you can see my head always points in the same direction. And that's why we have a North Star is because our head is always pointing in the same direction. Now in the Southern Hemisphere, I got to go to Chile last uh, summer and see the big telescopes. And they do have a South Pole in Chile in the Southern Hemisphere, but they don't have a North Star. So we're really, really lucky to be able to have a star here that points our way North. So if you ever get lost, it doesn't matter what night it is, what season it is, as long as you're in the Northern Hemisphere, look really hard and try and find the Big Dipper. And then if you draw a line through those Dipper end stars where the actual Dipper is, it will point to the North Star and that will help you find your location and that it'll help you use it as a compass. So you always have a compass with you for the rest of your life as long as you can see the stars. So for thousands of years, different cultures thought the bears were different things. So some people thought they was a plow, a wagon, a coffin, a skunk, a camel, a shark. I don't know if I see a shark, but that's kind of cool. They saw it as a canoe, a sickle, and a bushel. So all kinds of different ideas about that. Also, the cultures in Siberia and Alaska, they share a common heritage. And it's thought that as long ago as 50,000 years ago, there was a Paleolithic bear cult that existed. And so this constellation may have been around and passed down through oral tradition across human generations for 50,000 years. And the people up north thought this was a bear. So that's really, really cool. There are also birds in the sky, a lot of birds in the sky. There's a big goose in the sky or a swan. There's an eagle in the sky. And these are the constellations of Cygnus the swan and Aquila the eagle. You can also see a little constellation up there called Lyra. Now Lyra is a harp and that is the only constellation out of the 88 that is a musical instrument. So Cygnus, this swan or this goose here, in Greek myths, let me read you this story real quick about this one. Now once again, sometimes the Greek myths are really scary. This one is still a little scary but not as bad and it's focused on kindness ultimately, so I thought I would share this one with you. So two gods were racing chariots in space and the two friends were so intent and focused on the race that they were not paying attention at all to where they were going. Suddenly they found themselves too close to the sun and their chariots started to melt. The two friends fell, they fell down to earth and one fell through some trees which saved him and broke his fall but the other one landed in the river of the Milky Way and he was knocked unconscious. The first friend who fell in the trees wanted to rescue the other from the river, but he didn't know how to swim. 
So he asked Zeus, and Zeus in Greek mythology is known as the king of the gods. He asked Zeus to turn him into a swan so that he could dive down to the bottom of the river and save his friend. He, Zeus was so moved by this friendship that he turned him into a swan and he dove to the bottom of the river and he saved his friend's life. So Zeus was once again so moved by his bravery that when the swan, the friend, ultimately died, Zeus put him up in the sky as a reminder of kindness and friendship. I just think that's a beautiful story. There's also a dolphin in the sky. And the dolphin is one of my favorite constellations because he's so tiny. You can see how big Cygnus is and how big Aquila is, but the dolphin is tiny. And in Greek myth, Delphinius is known as dolphin. Also in Latin, Aquila is known as the eagle. And so that's why we still call this Aquila and Delphinius the dolphin. So we did a little bit of talking about asterisms, but I also wanna share with you some about scorpions. Now, I don't know about you, but I think scorpions and spiders are the coolest. And whenever I see a spider in my house, I don't kill it. I try and get it on a Kleenex or something and I take it outside because it has just as much right to live as I do. And I think they're super cool. So sometimes I get really close and I look at them. So there is a scorpion in the sky and he's in our southern sky and he's only visible during the summertime, but you can see him if you go outside. So this is what the sky would look like outside. And I'm gonna bring up the scorpion for you. <gasps> there he is in the sky. He's got claws, he's got his body that comes down and his tail with his stinger. There is also a teapot in the sky. So I'll pause here and see if we have any questions. And then I'm going to tell you some myths about Scorpius. Cool. So Carla, it does look like, um, I don't know if this is their name or not, but Mary Lou has their hand up. Yes. So I'm going to go ahead and let them speak and uh, let's see what they have to say. Maybe. <laughs> Do -do. Where did you go? Unmute. Nope. Maybe they didn't mean to raise their hand. Oh. Sorry, we didn't uh, have a question. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just wanted to check. <laughs> okay. Does anybody else have questions about the scorpion? Okay, it looks like, I don't know your name. It looks like PDCLA. I don't know. Do you want to go ahead and say something? Well, my name's actually Skylar. Mm -hmm. Skylar, okay. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, well, I was wondering if, like, the scorpion, it looks like, um, like, before the whole image appeared, I, I actually could see the stars and it connected. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, Scorpius is one of the easiest ones to pick out. It's one of the ones that when I see it in the sky too, I think, ah, that's a scorpion. <laughs> I also saw, I think I saw Olivia and um, Aaliyah raise their hand. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you guys. What's your question, Olivia? Um, why is there a scorpion in the sky? That's a good question. So, you know, once again, the constellations are just totally made up by humans because we like to create stories when we see patterns. And so some people thought that this just like a scorpion. To you, it might look like something totally different and that's completely okay. Cool. Okay, so I think that's it. You can go ahead and uh, okay. continue on, Carla. <laughs> Thank you, Haley. Yeah. Okay. So the Scorpius myth, do you remember when I talked about Orion earlier on saying Orion is only up in the winter? So that's one way we can use the sky as a calendar. Well, Orion and Scorpius have a very, very bad relationship. They are not kind to each other and they live in totally different parts of the sky. So Orion is in the winter 
Scorpius is always in the summer because we don't want them to ever fight again. So the, the gods made sure that they put them in separate places in the sky. So I'll tell you this quick little story. I kind of already like filled you in, but I'll give you the official story. So Orion was a mighty and a fearless hunter. So great, in fact, that he vowed to kill every animal on earth. I think that's horrible. It's horrible. But Gaia, the earth goddess, said, no, we are not going to let that happen. I am going to protect the animals. And she was so angered by Orion that she asked Scorpion, the giant scorpion, to kill him. Oh, that's not good either. Remember, this is a Greek myth. So he couldn't harm any more animals. So Scorpius attacked Orion and stung him with his stinger. And as a reward for the scorpion's bravery, Gaia put him in the sky to thank him for saving all of the animals in the world. So that's one story about the Scorpius. Now in Hawaii, they thought that Scorpius was Maui's fish hook and Maui was a god. So one day, Maui went fishing with his brothers in their canoe, and he brought with him a magic fish hook. His brothers said that he could keep whatever he caught with that magic fish hook. So they were continuing to paddle, and they were paddling and paddling as Maui was fishing, and they weren't looking back. Well, Maui caught a huge ob object and asked his brothers, paddle faster, paddle faster, which they did. And he hauled in many, many rocks and more rocks kept coming up. And he finally pulled so hard that huge parts of land came out of the ocean. His brothers got tired from all of the rowing and they were curious about what he had caught. So they looked back. One of the brothers called back, look, Maui is pulling up land. Furious, Maui the god responded, you fools, you should not have looked back. These islands could have been a great large land. Now we know these islands is Hawaii. And so if the brothers wouldn't have looked back and broken the spell, Hawaii could have been as big as our own continent. But so that's how the Hawaiians believed that their island chain was formed. So they're trying to create stories around creation and how they got to be where they are. Um, New Zealanders, even though New Zealand is a far, far way away from Hawaii, have a similar myth, which I think is really neat. Okay, let's see what else is in the sky. <gasps> I promised you dragons. This is Draco, the dragon. Now Draco lives between the big bear and the little bear. And there isn't a myth about it. It's just everyone always kind of saw him as a dragon, but we can create our own myths about the dragon. I also promised you unicorns. This is Monoceros, the unicorn. He's in the southern sky underneath Orion, so you can only see him in the winter. Granted, I'm not sure I really see a unicorn in the star patterns, but we'll go with it just because it's kind of cool. And there really isn't a myth around the unicorn either. Somebody just decided, hey, that looks like a unicorn. That's what I'm going to call it. Bohutes. What do you think this is? So this is up in the sky and it's actually visible. If you go outside tonight, you will see Bahutis. The brightest star down there towards the bottom is Arcturus and light from Arcturus takes 37 years to reach us here. It's a very, very orange star. So these are the stars that I identified in the constellation and I wanted to pull them out separate from the picture. And maybe Haley can help us look in the live chat to see what you think the constellation of Bohutis looks like. Okay, so yeah, you guys can respond in the chat or if you want, I can, if you guys wanna raise your hand, I can unmute you. What do you guys see? Let's see, it looks like Olivia and, uh, and Aaliyah say a boat. Ah. And then it looks like Skylar's raising his hand. Do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, Skylar? 
Okay. Whoop. Go ahead, Skylar. Oh. <laughs> Here, I'll click on mute. Okay, it looks like um, somebody says a kite, a diamond ring, and Skylar, what do you think? Um, it looks like a person juggling. A person juggling? That's cool. Let's see, anybody else raising their hand? Oh, somebody says an upside, oh, Dax and Archer say an upside down tie. Oh, yeah. And I think everybody has weighed in who wants to weigh in. <laughs> okay. So what they, what the myths say is that this constellation is a shepherd. So it's a man or a woman that tends a flock of sheep. And so I'm not sure I see that. Um, what I usually see is an ice cream cone, to be honest. I see an ice cream cone and it makes me want dessert every time I go outside in the summertime. So thank you for participating and giving us your ideas. Um, constellations, once again, are completely human, you know, constructs. We just make them up. Um, they really don't help us a lot for science, except for knowing where something is in the sky, but they're really fun. So if you want to learn more about constellations and calendar and how we can use the sky as our clock and our compass, NASA has a great website for kids called NASA Space Place. And once again, I can send you the, the, uh, the website address. We've got that in my last slide. So NASA Space Place has a lot of great activities and places to learn more. And then two, if you want to find the constellations, you can go out and you can buy this star finder here and see how it turns around. So you can also make one for yourself. I think last summer or the summer before I did a program at the library where we printed these out and we made them ourselves. And what you basically just do is you decide on the month and the time and then you do that and then that's the sky that you see. So you want to make sure when you use one of these that you use it as a hat. So put it over your head like a hat and then hold it up and that's how you'll see what's up in the sky. Sky and Telescope has a great interactive one um, that you can play with on the computer or they also have one that you can print out and then you can cut and you can make your own star chart. Super cool. So these are the resources. If you want to take a screenshot of these resources to use later, feel free to do that. I'll give you a couple of minutes to take or a couple of seconds to take a screenshot if you want to use any of those. And be sure and check out that video that we weren't able to see. And you can fly around the Big Dipper. And that's from the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. So it should be kid friendly. You should be able to get on there and watch that without any problems. So I just wanted to thank you for spending this time today. Remember to keep looking up at the skies and writing down your own stories. Well, thank you so much, Carla. Um, it looks like um, Sloan and Tegan have a question for you. It says, do you think we will be able to see the Neowise Comet? Yes, I have been looking at the comet for about two weeks with my telescope back here. I have a lot of telescopes, but this one is small and portable. And so I've been going outside um, and looking. Now it is getting farther away and so it's starting to get dimmer. But if you go outside tonight and it's not cloudy and you can kind of get to a darker space, find the Big Dipper and just look down from the Big Dipper and you should be able to see it. You probably will need binoculars. Last week you could see it without binoculars, but this week it's, it's starting to go out of our solar system and it won't be back for about another 7,000 years. So it's really starting to get dim, but yes, you can still go out and see it or you can uh, search the, the internet for pictures of it. A lot of astronomers have been taking pictures and posting them online. So it's called Comet Neowise. So if you just Google Comet and it's spelled N-E-O-W-I-S-E, 
and then type in NASA or astronomy, you should be able to get some kids safe pictures of looking at Comet Neowise. Cool. Um, it looks like Skylar has a question. Do you want to go ahead and ask Skylar? You want to unmute yourself? Um, since you work at NASA, well, you used to, um, I was wondering if you helped me curious. It's one of the rovers that, um, it was on Mars. Yeah. So I was working there when they were building the Curiosity rover, and I got to be there on the night that it landed on Mars. And it was such a special time. And we were, we had a lot of very important people at NASA that wanted to be there and wanted to be in the control room and watch to see if it would safely get to the service, the surface. Remember that seven minutes of terror video of all the things that had to go right to get it down there? Well, I got to be there that night and I heard the shouts from the team when it landed safely and everybody was crying and we were shaking and we were so excited. And I was walking down one of the streets because NASA labs are big and there's streets and buildings and fire departments and doctor's offices and it's like a mini city. And I was walking down a street and I saw an astronaut. He was my big boss and his name was Leland Melvin. And he is the astronaut that took pictures with his dogs. And it's really cute. And I told him, I said, Leland, look up. The International Space Station is going through the sky on the night that we landed on Mars. How amazing. And Leland paused and he looked up and he said, that used to be my home. So he had lived on the International Space Station for a long period of time. And I got to share that moment with him. And it was just so touching how, how the skies and how science and astronomy all bond us together. So yeah, the Curiosity rover is still there, still doing great work. And in about a week, we're going to try and launch another rover called Perseverance to Mars. And now granted, it's just launching. So it's gonna take about nine months to get to Mars, but then hopefully we'll see it, you know, drop down into the atmosphere and land safely and start continuing to do the same research that Curiosity was doing. This rover has some more instruments on it and some more specialized stuff. Um, so it's basically picking up the baton from Curiosity. Even though Curiosity is still in the race, it's gonna pick up the baton for Curiosity and continue that research. That is so cool. Thank you so much, Carla. And thanks, Skylar, for that great question. Yeah. Um, it looks like Olivia and Aaliyah said, just thank you for doing this. <laughs> um, and I don't see any other questions in the chat. Does anybody else have questions? I'm looking, trying to see if I can see everybody's screens that I can see if they're raising their hands. And I think we're okay. I think that's all. Um, I don't see any other questions. So Carla, thank you so much. I love listening to you talk about space. <laughs> it, it gets me so excited and I, I hope that it gets everybody else excited too. And now I want to like go outside and try and find some constellations tonight. See if I can figure it out. <laughs> well, if anybody has any questions, if you ever want to contact me, just go to the NASA Solar System Ambassadors website and you can find me in Colorado and you can find me in Fort Collins. And if you click on that, it'll send me an email. So you can send me a message through that website if you have any more questions on space, on constellations, on myths, on stars, on the Perseverance rover, Curiosity rover, anything like that. You can always send me questions. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Carla. And thanks everybody who joined us um, on Zoom and on Facebook. So. Uh, Keep in touch. We'll have more library programs in the future and we'll talk to you later. Bye everybody. Bye. <laughs>